Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Saber Day. I am very glad that uh, we are able to have this event with uh, the Dusty Baker Sacramento Saber Chapter and the Lefty Odul Bay Area Chapter. My name is Zach Ford. I am the chair of the Dusty Baker Sacramento Saber Chapter. I'm glad everybody could join us this morning. I have a few announcements. Uh, first off, um, if you're able to mute yourselves, that would be great. There will be opportunity for Q&A and comments um, after each presenter. Um, we'll make sure that we have the chat going as well if you have some questions that way. Um, as far as our chapter, I um, have a few individual announcements and I'll pass it over to Marlene for some general Sabre uh, announcements as well. Uh, first off, we are excited. We will be meeting in person for luncheon on Saturday, March 18th in Sacramento at Sam's Hofbrau. We're back to Sam's Hofbrau. Um, we're going to have Eric Gray um, speak with us. He's a, a good friend of Sabre. We've had him actually about three or four years ago uh, when his first book came out. Uh, he has another book on uh, baseball stories, uh, primarily fan stories, just kind of like the uh, importance, the uh, um, personal connection, human interest stories um, of what baseball means to them, different baseball events. Um, Andy McHugh is also going to be joining us to talk about his new book, uh, Stumbling Around the Bases, uh, which is uh, uh, primarily about how the American League uh, dealt with the expansion era of the 60s and 70s. Um, he's also, uh, he's won uh, Sabres, uh, two of Sabres biggest awards, um, uh, Bob David's award, and then also the Seymour uh, award too for his uh prior book, uh, Mover and Shaker, about uh, O'Malley. Um, also, um, did check out Baker Family Wines a couple weeks ago. Uh, Baker Family Wines, uh, owned by Dusty, um, has a partnership with uh, Bike Dog Brewing in there. So it's almost like a casual wine slash beer that partnership. So there's a little bit for everybody, whether or not you'd like wine, whether or not you like beer, you got food trucks, et cetera. Wanted to have a social gathering there. It would it wouldn't Dusty obviously is focused on the season. He'll be heading off to Houston or Florida soon, I guess I should say. Um, but it would just be a, a like a casual happy hour type thing that we would have. Um, looking forward to that. And then also for this summer, um, I had one of our members uh, that lives in the Placerville area, which is about a half hour east of Sacramento, uh, indicate that he um, would like to. Uh, invite members over to his ranch. Um, he has a 25% uh, size replica wiffle ball field of uh, Fenway Park Ooh. that he said that he would let us play at, which sounds pretty darn cool to me. And then he also has a 2000 square foot uh, baseball museum of his personal memorabilia um, on his property too. So that would be something that we'd be do doing in, in the summer when I could be a little bit more confident in outside weather. Um, so I'll go ahead and pass it over to uh, Marlene, um, who has a few uh, Sabre announcements Reminded. and a few other ball events too. Well, I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of Steve Dredder and myself. We're your co-chairs. Um, we're very pleased that you could all join us. I wanted to remind you about some upcoming regular scheduled meetings, upcoming meetings, and uh, other events. Uh, our chapter continues to meet with uh, the Dusty Baker chapter fairly regularly. We're trying to do this monthly on Zoom. Uh, we have not returned to in-person meetings given uh, COVID precautions and the lack of venues. Many of the spaces that we used to use, Lefty O'Doul's, um, uh, Ricky's in San Leandro, the Englander in San Leandro have closed or changed hands and other spaces have gotten fairly expensive in order to book. So for those reasons, we're continuing to do Zoom meetings regularly, uh, which enable us to, to get authors from all over the country and that's great. Um, so we may try to do something maybe at the San Jose, San Jose Giants if we can organize something like that this summer, but that's where we are. We're always looking for people who might want to uh, help us to plan meetings or suggest speakers. Um, there's no lack of possibilities with that. And as you know, we're a fun group to work with. 
I want to remind you about the monthly base ballpark images program that Sabre offers on the, usually the first Thursday of every month. Uh, Shakia Taylor interviews a wide variety of people who are not the big name people in baseball, but it's always an interesting conversation. And as you know from reading your This Week in Sabre analytics is coming up, our conference will be in Chicago this summer. Um, hope that many of you will be able to get there. The Nine Conference, which is a, uh, a smaller, more intimate conference, is in uh, Scott is not Scottsdale, Tempe. Uh, March 1st through 4th. Um, you can read more about that on the Nine Conference website. Um, this year, they're going to be honoring Jean Ardell, um, the historian and author who passed away earlier this year. And then um, at the end of September, the last weekend in September, beginning October, is the fourth annual International Women's Baseball Center Sabre Women in Baseballs Conference. And that that will once again be virtual this year to allow um, participants from all over the world to join us. So um, hope to see you at those events. I wanna welcome any new members who are with us. I think we have a few. Um, it's always, uh, I'm looking forward to getting to know you. Please feel free to call me or Steve. And I'm gonna give this back to uh, John, uh, excuse me, to Zach, who is going to get us started. So thanks for being with us. You make me smile seeing your faces. Thank you very much, Marlene. Um, I have the honor of uh, introducing my good buddy, John Linodakis, um, longtime friend of Sabre, especially both of our chapters, um, has been a presenter uh, for a few of our events, both in person and Zoom. Um, was a, We had a great event with John right before the world got weird, just about a few weeks before things got really odd in 2020. Um, <laughs> he was able to come out and show a little bit of his film, uh, Superfan, which is about a, one of our members who went on a quest for having every player and executive and coach of his 1979 Giants media guy get signed. Uh, so that was that was a fun event we had John at. I uh, also had him talk about a sweet spot, uh, a little docu series with short little baseball stories. Uh, he looks like he has that as his background today. Um, and also Arnold Hanno, um, who some of you may know, who wrote uh, the, you know, the, the classic book, A Day in the Bleachers. Uh, today, he's going to be talking about uh, Ball Four Turns 40, which is this new film, which docu documents the baseball reliquaries uh, celebration, the 40th anniversary 12 years ago. He's also going to be touching a little on uh, the uh, next project that he has uh, that's in the works on Lefty O'Doul. Um, so we're excited to have John with us. Um, it's always a pleasure, John. Go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you, Zach and Marlene, for inviting me to present today. It's, it's nice to see everyone. I'm going to share my screen, um, and then I'll get started here. So let me get, make sure that's all working. And uh, when I go full screen, I won't be able to see everyone. So Zach, keep me honest if something goes strange. All right, can you see the screen okay? Yep, looks good. Okay, great. So I'm a, I'm a Sabre member, a member of the Hall of Fame wow. and the Baseball Reliquary. I'm a storyteller and baseball documentarian. I've been a producer in the entertainment industry for over 30 years, working mostly on TV commercials, Disney theme parks, museums, and my favorite genre, uh, documentaries. Um, as Zach mentioned, I'm going to share with you about my latest film, Ball, Ball 4 Turns 40, but I, I also want to give a little bit of an overview um, about the effort of telling baseball stories through the medium of film. So I'm going to share some of my journey through baseball and film projects with you, as well as some other short films I have that are tied to the Giants. And of course, my next project, a documentary about Lefty O'Doul. So... I'm a lifelong baseball fan, bitten by the bug in the summer of 1963. I fell hard for the game, baseball cards, and my hometown team, the San Francisco Giants. I grew up in the Twin Peaks area of the city and ended up working in the parking lots at Candlestick Park from 1970 to 75. I was a kid who grew up loving four things, baseball, comic books, TV, and movies. I have a bachelor's degree 
in communication arts with an emphasis in film and television production from Loyola Marymount University. My career has been a crazy quilt of eclectic products, projects, I should say, from around the entertainment industry, like low budget horror films like Maniac Cop Part Two. If you can believe it, they made four of them. Uh, the Last American Version to music videos uh, for Oingo Boingo and the Stray Cats in the MTV era, and lots and lots of car and motorcycle commercials for Honda, Lincoln Mercury, and Mercedes Benz. In 1996, one of my best friends, Denny Tedesco, was making a documentary about an elite group of Los Angeles studio musicians. His father, Tommy Tedesco, was a legendary guitarist and a member of that group. Tommy was dying of cancer and Denny asked if I could help. So I worked on it for five years, and it was a lot of fun meeting and working with folks like Glenn Campbell, Herb Alpert, and the first lady of the electric bass, Carol Kay. That project turned out to be a music documentary called The Wrecking Crew, which went on to win many awards and notoriety around the world. Now, I accompanied the film to festivals to, in Nashville and, and at South by Southwest and was given a badge with my name on it, and below it, it said filmmaker, and it made me realize how much I missed making films and went on a mission to explore telling baseball stories in that medium. Now, around that time, um, I went to events staged by the Baseball Reliquary, and I was really taken by their approach to celebrating human stories and people from all walks of life that impacted the landscape of the game and American culture. No one seemed to be mining those stories in the visual medium. And I thought the world had more than enough documentaries on the Yankees, Dodgers, Babe Ruth, and the same old stories over and over again. So I put my hand on a rock and proclaimed myself a baseball documentarian. I own and operate my micro studio, which is called Evzone Media and Experiential. We develop, finance, produce, uh, produce, distribute, and promote original content and take on freelance projects uh, for promo films and such. Now, my goal has always been to make baseball documentaries about the human side of the game, the stories beyond the stats, if you will. This fueled a multimedia project I started in 2016 entitled The Sweet Spot. And the mission is to look at the national pastime from a perspective that is humanistic, iconoclastic, and academic. Along with human stories, we also examine social issues like race and gender in a national pastime. So I've made films about legendary writer Arnold Haino, Mudcat Grant, Jackie Robinson, Ernie Banks, women from the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, the 1989 World Series Earthquake, and the Baseball Reliquary. My films are available on Amazon Prime, The Sweet Spot, on Vimeo On Demand, and on our Patreon site. Ten of my films are in the Hall of Fame's permanent collection. We also have a book available on Amazon called Baseball Pioneers, True Stories of Guts and Glory, as told by the men and women of the game, as well as a custom set of trading cards featuring folks like umpire Perry Barber, pitcher Isla Borders, and Topps photographer Doug McWilliams, who's with us here today. Anyhow, now I've recently been using a terrific distribution resource called Film Hub, and I'm in the process of uploading 27 original films to them. They serve over 100 streaming studios, and the results have been great thus far. Amazon has picked up Hano, a, a, a Century in the Bleachers, my film about the uh, 89 earthquake called The Day the World Series Stopped, and my latest, Fall Ford Turns 40. Um, there's another film that's already on there. It's actually an episodic piece. It's called Shut Out, The Battle American Women Wage to play baseball. And uh, it's available for streaming now, as is Hano and the Day the World Series Stopped. Now, Shutout is presented in its original nine episode format. And Ball Four Turns 40 is going to be on Amazon any day now. So I'm going to show you a, a, a short trailer for um, Shutout um, on Amazon Prime. <laughs> One of my players was hit every single time she was at bat just trying to play high school baseball. The entire league decided they would hit her.
culture has thrown everything they can at them to keep them off the field. After the war and after our league, a league of their own, um, died, people, the women, were supposed to go back in the house and forget about being uh, Rosie the Riveter and being able to play. It was awful. I had bullying, harassment, abuse, violence, everything you can imagine. I see a connection between um, accessibility of women getting the chance to play baseball and what's going on in our country and, and the opportunities that women have in our country. The politics of separate but equal don't apply. I mean, softball is not baseball. I remember several games playing first base and the first base umpire would be saying, you know, when are you going to switch to softball? But why do girls want to play baseball? Why are they told, no, we have this other game for you? I had uh, called two or three other fantasy camp directors, and two of them had basically laughed in my face, and the other one had hung up the phone. So my daughter's always been playing with the boys, but there were times where you would see a slide just a little bit harder, and then you would hear the, let's just get rid of the girl. Let's just take her out. And as a parent, it's like, what? They're five years old. When you play with girls, you show that you respect them. All the girls who play baseball, they just want to be part of the team. So I was the first girl in Nevada to play for a varsity baseball. The way the press treats it is like, this is a freak of nature. Look at this girl. She can pitch. Look at this girl. She can hit. about baseball it's just a, it's fun and then I get to play with the boys and show them up baseball for all is a national nonprofit for girls who want to get in the game whether it's playing umpiring or coaching essentially we empower girls to know that their their dreams are worth it lady and the and the MLB. So you know we played in the 2006 Women's Baseball World Cup and we won gold that year and it was fantastic. Just this past fall in 2015 I became the first woman to coach for a major league baseball organization and that was with the uh, Oakland Athletics. Give them a chance. That's all we ask. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do something because you're different. We're all able to see and hear that okay? Yes. Okay, great. Great. So um, you, you can watch that uh, today after we're done on Amazon Prime, and it's in uh, uh, nine different episodes. So anyhow, what I'd like to talk about now is the strategic approaches and a process uh, we go to, uh, go, I go through um, to selecting a subject. So now I worked at Disney for over a decade, and I learned this axiom from them. If you're going to create a product or experience, it has to be unique and well executed. I spent a number of years collecting and curating stories by attending baseball events, reading books, researching the web, and from my own experiences. And I've developed a, an extensive network of friends and contacts through the Baseball Reliquary, the Hall of Fame, the Nine Spring Training Conference, and other means. So just like a book project, I have to determine the narrative I'm sorry? Was that you, Zach? No, no keep going. I think we're good. good. Okay, good. So, no, it so this, uh, this is a reminder. Just keep yourself on mute, please, if you're not one of the presenters. Okay, cool. Thanks, Zach. So as I say, just like a book project, I have to determine the narrative focus and structure, themes, contact potential interviewees, and do a lot of research. And that's where the similarities end. Uh, the shoots have to be planned. The crew has to be hired. Usually it's just me and one or two other people, very lean and mean. And field logistics, which are my specialty. 
the creative approach too is, is a big piece. Who to interview, where are we gonna do it? Questions to ask, what supporting footage we need to capture. It, has, it all has to support the narrative design. The interviews are critical as those oral histories become the voiceover narration for the film. I don't like the omniscient point of view narration. I want people involved in the story to tell it, not some disembodied voice. It's much more organic and relatable when you've got the people in, entrenched in the story telling you about it. And once the footage is in the can, I create transcripts and I begin selecting the best material from them, organizing them by theme on three by five cards or on an Excel spreadsheet. I own high def camera equipment, a sound gear, grip and electrical stuff. And I have an edit suite uh, where, I think I missed a slide here. Nope. I didn't. I have an edit suite where we can do all the finishing, including color correction and sound mix to create the final film we then distribute. So now on to my latest film, Ball 4 Turns 40. Uh, like some of you, I am a huge fan of Jim Bouton and Ball 4. I bought it the first day it was available in the summer of 1970 when I was 12 years old, and it remains one of my favorite books. I've been a member of the Baseball Reliquary since 2002, and in 2009, I realized 2010 would have been, was, was going to be the 40th anniversary of Ball 4. So I suggested to Reliquary leader, Terry Cannon, to have a day celebrating the book on the occasion of a milestone anniversary. He loved the idea and spent a year putting together an amazing program for an event that was really, it truly was legendary. Um, Let's see here. I think I got my pages mixed up. Oh, yeah, here we go. So the Los Angeles Times ran a story about it a few days in advance, resulting in a packed house at the Burbank Central Library. Jim Bouton was flown out, and he was joined by former pilots teammates Greg Goosen and Tommy Davis. And there was a panel discussion about the book's cultural impact with filmmaker Ron Shelton, Bull Durham, uh, author Gene Hastings Ardell, and David Kippen, former director of literature for the National Endowment of the Arts. The event was moderated by author David Davis. The event also featured the world premiere of the Seattle Pilots documentary in the, in the lobby of the library, glittered with gold from Charles Kapner's world-class collection of Seattle Pilots relics and artifacts. The event ran an astonishing six hours, which included lunch, and ended with a book signing with Tommy Davis, Greg Goosen, Gene Ardell, and Jim. It was absolutely incredible. Now I'm going to show you the trailer for the film, and here we go. <laughs> This is something different. I mean, who thinks of bringing in Jim Bouton and Tommy Davis and Greg Goose and, and all these people that the average fan would be like, huh, who, what? But the baseball fan, the real fans, like, oh, wow. Uh, you know, I can hardly believe it. You know, when I think back uh, at the time I was keeping these notes, the idea that one day, years later, 40, 40 years later, somebody would be still talking about the book. So they, they, they figured I was just going to write a regular sports book. You know, i got a big game tomorrow, and I sure hope uh, Gary's feeling well because we really need this win, and we've lost three in a row, and we got to go get him. You know, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was actually writing about uh, Fred Talbot and Merritt Renew arguing about which part of the South was dumber. <laughs> it, it's just the oddest set of circumstances in the world. I mean, what team... It's around one lousy a year. I mean, I mean, a, a little league team is, is longer than that. I mean, this was the big leagues. That's the strangest year I've ever had in my life. Really? In terms of in the clubhouse, how prevalent were greenies back in, you know, late 60s, early 70s in the game? I could use a couple right now. Oh, Harry Walker is the one who manages this crew. He doesn't like it when we drink and fight and smoke and screw.
So I thought making a documentary celebrate, by the way, that film will be available on Amazon either probably in the next week or so. Um, anyhow, I thought making a documentary celebrating the book that just might be the best selling baseball book of all time, it sold somewhere between five and six million copies, was worthwhile and that there would be an audience for it. Now, I was at the event in 2010 as part of the mission to cover a year in the life of the baseball reliquary for my film about them, not exactly Cooperstown. We shot the event with three cameras with a crew of four. And I only used a sliver from the event in that film and hoped to someday revisit it as a larger project at some point down the road. It just took me about uh, 10, 12 years to do that. So in late 2021, the time was right. And I began a very challenging project to boil down hours of material to tell the story of the event, Jim Bouton and the book. It took nearly a year of work in the edit bay, adding special effects, voiceover recording, bringing in voice actors with additional filming of tableaus for insert shots. The biggest challenge was the footage from the event. I had no budget to work with in 2010 and I borrowed all of the equipment which featured standard definition video cameras. I was worried that today's audiences who are used to 4K and high definition media would scoff at the lower quality. I came up, I came up with a solution of putting that material inside a television set from 1970, which also allowed me to use a variety of narrative devices to help tell the story and break up the event. So I ended up, I took a bug and ended up making it a feature. And several viewers have mentioned to me that they really like the old television bezel, sort of enhancing nostalgic feeling of days gone by. Support from the, for the project came from Saber, author Mitchell Nathanson, who wrote the terrific biography of, of Jim Bouton, the Hall of Fame, uh, the Baseball Reliquary, filmmaker Ron Shelton, and Jim Bouton's son, Michael. Reception has been very good thus far, and Michael Bouton and his mother, Bobby, Jim's first wife, wrote to me that, to tell me that they loved it. The film was also a very personal journey for me, uh, from a baseball-crazed preteen, reading and learning about things like voyeurism, illegal pep pills, skirt chasing, and paternity suits. I was able to meet Jim the night before the event and share dim dinner with him and Terry and Mary Cannon. He was smart, personable, funny, and friendly. And, and he, he, he taught me how to throw a knuckleball, which was really cool. Uh, the final edition of the book came out in 2014, four years after the event. And Jim was kind enough to put me in a new added chapter about the baseball reliquary. And that brought things full circle for me. After the event, I maintained email correspondence with Jim about baseball and one of his hobbies, making stone walls. So now I want to switch gears and talk about uh, the Lefty O'Doul project. Um, the goal is, uh, in order to do this project, we're going to do some fundraising. And um, I like stories about underdogs or people who've not received proper credit for extraordinary acts or performance. Lefty O'Doul's story is very compelling. One of the greatest hitters the game has ever known, the winningest manager in Pacific Coast League history, and the father of Japanese professional baseball. And for some strange reason, he's not in the Hall of Fame, either as an inductee or an ambassador for the game. I became familiar with Tom O'Doul and interviewed him at Lefty's Old Restaurant in the summer of 2016. I then met Dennis Snelling, who's with us today, uh, who wrote the excellent biography uh, on Lefty. When COVID shutdown came in 2020, I decided to create a trailer to promote interest in a prospective film about Lefty O'Doul. I worked closely with Tom and Dennis and had help from many baseball experts like Doug McWilliams, Mark McRae, and David Eskenazi, artists Arthur K. Miller and Charles Mandel of Helmar Brewing lent their wonderful art. So in a month or so, I'm gonna begin the process of fundraising via crowdfunding. And here I'm gonna show you the trailer for the Lefty Odoo film.
I love to play. When I was playing ball in the big league, my bats were jumping in the, in, in the top. Since we're in Giants country, um, I wanted to share two other short films with you. Both of them were inspired by writer Arnold Haino as I was making the film about him. One of Arnold's most interesting assignments for Sport Magazine was covering the losing team from every game of the 1962 World Series where the Giants played the Yankees. It's easy to write about a winner. Losers are more complicated. And he started to be viewed as an unwelcome guest in the clubhouse after a loss. Giants second baseman Chuck Hiller said, he wants color, huh? I'll color his nose. I asked one of the film's interviewees, the great writer, John Shulian, if he'd select a couple of his favorite Hano pieces and read them on camera. One he selected and was called Tension and Torment and it is one of the most poignant pieces of sports writing I've ever read. Spoiler alert, the Giants lost the hard fought series in seven games with game seven ending one to nothing as Willie, Ma Willie McCovey's screaming line drive was snared by a perfectly positioned Bobby Richardson. So here is the short film, Tension and Torment. Jack Sanford sat on a rub-down table, slumped against a wall of the Giants clubhouse at Candlestick Park. He did not move. He did not talk. A writer leaned over and said something quietly to Sanford, and the big pitcher, not looking up, said, I do not want to answer questions. He sat like that in the trainer's room where ball players go to escape the press after a galling ball game. But on this day, the press and other people intruded and there was no escape. So Jack Sanford sat in silence. Next to him, Jim Davenport talked of playing golf the next day with Al Dark. Don Larson sat in a corner of the same rub down room and three times he said the famous four letter obscenity. Chuck Hiller came into the room and he said to nobody in particular, how I'd love to see him next year, the obscenity Yankees. But Sanford didn't move, he didn't talk. 55 minutes went by, then Sanford stood and walked through the giant clubhouse. He went across a brief corridor that separates the giant clubhouse from the visiting clubhouse, in this case, the New York Yankee clubhouse, and walked inside the Yankee dressing room and over to Ralph Terry. He spoke quietly to Terry and shook his hand and Terry hugged Sanford and spoke into his ear and Sanford walked out. This is the way one man loses. So in the middle of making the film with Arnold Hino, 
I asked him if he had any home movies, and he said he did. I found sparkling 16 millimeter color film, which included footage of a summer trip to Fire Island in New York in the summer of 1961. Arnold and his wife joined writer Ray Robinson and his wife for this get together. And as I was watching this old 16 millimeter home movies uh, that Arnold had, I noticed there was a black guy wearing a Sports Illustrated t-shirt with them. And I asked Arnold who that was, and he replied nonchalantly, oh, that's Monty Irvin. Oh, wait, what do you mean that's Monty Irvin? This is incredible. So there were some pieces I, I just couldn't fit into the Hano film. And so I made this short film uh, about that story with Monty Irvin, and here it is. A, a few years after the Giants left the polo grounds, uh, I, I still kept up my relationship with Ray Robinson. He was an editor and a friend. And Bonnie and I and our daughter, Laurel, who was nine or so around, around that time, we flew back to New York and we spent a, a few days in Fire Island with Ray and Phyllis Robinson, and who had guests that same weekend, uh, Monty Irvin and his darling wife. It was a very memorable weekend. I had invited Monty Irvin, who was a good friend of mine, and would have been, I think, easily as good a candidate as the first black in the game as Jackie. Uh, and I invited him and his wife, Dee. And the same weekend, I invited uh, Arnold with uh, Bonnie to come. It was a very small house, but we managed to fit them all in. And the big moment of that weekend was when the kids in the neighborhood learned that Bonnie was staying with us they demanded that he come out and play with them. So I found an old bat in my, my house. I gave it to Monty. I said, Monty, would you do me a favor? Would you stand? It was very low tide that particular weekend. Would you stand and hit balls into the ocean and these kids will retrieve them? He said, I'll do it. He said, but it's awful hot. I said, you, you played in hotter weather than this. So he stood there, and a lot of us, Arnold included, threw balls at Monty, and he hit his typical line drives into the ocean. And the kids in the neighborhood would retrieve the, the balls. And Monty was perfectly happy to pick up a bat and a, and a ball and hit fungos. He hit the most gigantic fungos you ever saw. He hit them 400 feet. They, they, they were scraping the, 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 the ceilings, the, the, the sky. And, and my daughter, who had a glove that was bigger than, than, the, than the rest of her body, practically, was standing there, uh, sort of trembling her body as these things came crushing down at her. And one of them, she stood under, and she stood under, and she got up a glove, and finally the, the, the ball hit the glove, and it drove her to her knees, but she hung on to it, and she turned and looked so happily, uh, and Ray and, and, and I and Monty Irvin applauded her. D during that period, he hit the fungos and he, he, he played a soft game of catch with us, especially with the kids uh, tossing the ball back and forth. Here's this six foot three inch, 210 pound Hall of Famer, Monty Irvin, uh, and uh, nine year old Laurel Hano uh, with, with his glove. And she was, she was thrilled. She was enthralled by him. It was like a, a special giant. In small G, large G, giant in her life at that time. Well, I hope you enjoyed uh, those short films in my presentation. Thank you all for your kind attention, and I will stop sharing my screen. I can figure out how. <laughs> yeah, let's do this. That was Perfect. wonderful, John. Now I know I, what I can watch uh, at night or during the day even. Thanks for the reminders. Yeah, I'm having a little technical issue here getting off of the screen sharing. I hope you guys can just move on without me.
everything everything seems fine right now john okay good yeah all so right. we're we're all right so um we will have time for a question and answer so if you have um any questions for john about any of his films um please go ahead and put them in the chat or raise your hand um on uh, on zoom there should be a little button that would allow you to uh to do that through the uh, reactions on the uh, bottom um if you're able to do that you'll have the opportunity to uh discuss things further with john um just a uh, one a follow-up question for me from me while we're uh, waiting on member questions tell us a little bit more about uh your uh, your time frame for this lefty dual project um obviously with us being in the uh, in the bay area a lot of us are lefty fans for for multiple reasons um but tell us a little bit about what your estimated time frames are and uh you know you had mentioned that you'd be doing some fundraising and trying to get the uh, the word out tell us how we can help you too with that um I'm planning on uh, putting this together, that effort to raise, do fundraising. It, it'll be in about a month or so because I've got to finish this other giant project of getting all my films to the distributor. Um, and I have to go about the business of putting together the budget so I know how much money to ask for. So um, once I have that together, you know, it's great to have the trailer because that's a nice selling piece, gives people a sense of kind of the approach to it. But um, I'm hoping, you know, maybe by the beginning of baseball season that uh, we'll be able to begin the fundraising process. And then uh, and uh, will, we'll have to raise all of the funding required because in the past I funded all my own stuff and I just can't do that anymore. So um, so once we get that, once we get the funding together, um, you know, we'll go ahead and begin um, the, the production process, which will probably take anywhere from a month to two months really the big the big work is done in the edit bay uh putting everything together um and i anticipate when the film is done it'll probably be about a half an hour very good very good i do see a couple of hands that have popped up uh first one i saw pop up was steve treader there we are there we are hey john um <clears throat> I'm struck in seeing sort of a you know a, a summary of several of your of your film projects. <clears throat> Obviously, baseball is the common theme of them, but but beyond that, as you kind of mentioned at the beginning, there seems to be sort of an underlying theme that ties these disparate projects together, and it is I I, I want you to elaborate on this. I, it's it's this humanistic um, uh, theme to them. We're we're not just celebrating champion teams and great players. We're getting deeper than that, and we're and we're talking about how baseball and 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 the, the the triumphs and the challenges of it, you know, sort of animates the human spirit and 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 triumph and tragedy and it, it, there I don't know it, there is a there's a common undercurrent of broader life to your film projects that I, I, I that I find and I just I just wonder if you could elaborate on on why you choose these these subjects. Well, I think humanistic is is, is the right uh, idea there, Steve. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I was really influenced by the baseball reliquary and their approach to the human side of the game and to go beyond the statistics. There was a great quote somewhere where somebody said that baseball has always been a reflection of American society, good or bad. So I wanted to do two types of stories. One was stories about the game, the people in the game, you know, people like Doug, or, or we, I did an interview with Mike Murphy, you know, the, the great clubhouse guy for the Giants for 60 years or what, what have you. Um, and then also taking a look at social issues like gender discrimination and racism. I made a film with Mudcat Grant called Race Ball um, about, you know, his experiences with racism in the game and how he beat it. Um, but I think, you know, baseball lends itself to so many different types of stories. And I think baseball, more than any other sport, um, has narr narrative is at the heart and soul of baseball. And I think uh, after seeing so much of the same kind of material what? being brought out in front of everybody for decades, uh, uh, you know, Ted Williams, Babe Ruth, Willie Mays, all great stuff. But there's so much other material, and I really wanted to start to collect those kinds of stories and share them. 
All right. Uh, next up, Dennis Snelling. Hi, John. Good to see you. Dennis. Um, because your stories are so much about people and their feelings and, and everything, um, what's your process for getting people to open up and be natural with a camera there and and uh, knowing, oh, this is going to be permanently what I say? How, how do you get people to to open up? What's the psychology there? And are there people that you had difficulty uh, getting to open up about themselves? Now we're getting into the black art. Um, <laughs> And, um, you know, people skills play into this. And when uh, I first contact someone and um, we kind of have a discussion about what it is we're doing, make sure they're comfortable with just the whole notion of it. And then the next piece is we want, I want to do the interview with them in an environment where they are most comfortable. For example, with, with Doug McWilliams, we went to Doug's house and, and we shot in Doug's office. I mean, it was just, it was like a perfect setting. Um, and then the other thing is, I don't have a bunch of people with me in the room. There's like me and one other person. Um, I've done some interviews where it's just me. Um, and I did that with uh, Emma Amaya, who is the, like this amazing Dodger fan. Um, and, you know, and, and some of these people break down during um, the interviews. And, you know, that's only after we built up a lot of trust. And Emma, I had known for a long time prior to that. But there are other things um, that will be triggers uh, that people might get a little bit more emotional. But the whole thing is about establishing rapport and them getting an, an understanding and an appreciation that I know what I'm doing, that they're going to be treated right. They're going to be treated um, fairly, um, you know, so it's a big process of getting everybody comfortable. And by the time we sit down in front of the camera, it's not an interview. Um, uh, the great German documentary filmmaker, um, Werner Herzog, uh, there was a great masterclass I took from him online. And he said, it's not an interview. It's a discussion. It's a conversation. If because when you when you make it an interview, it's too formal. And I think when you're telling these human stories, you want it to be organic, you want it to be casual, you want people to be comfortable in their true selves. We'll go ahead and go with with uh, Doug real quick. I think you may have a follow up uh, on the what was referenced, and then we'll go over to chat after Doug. And you you're, the, you're Doug. hit the little microphone in the lower left hand corner, Doug. There, you there go. we go. Okay. Uh, I was surprised. Uh, we talked about it, what he was going to talk about. And so by the time he arrived and got all set up, um, it was very comfortable. I was just talking to somebody I knew, although I didn't know him. But the thing I liked most is at the very end, and I think he did this several other times. I haven't seen it on all the shows he did, but he threw a baseball to me. <laughs> he says, what does this mean to you? And I thought that was really interesting because I didn't know it was coming. <laughs> and uh, threw me a fastball. <laughs> or a and and, and uh, Doug, thanks for mentioning that because after every interview I've done, I've done, you know, over a hundred or so, I put a brand new baseball in the interview subject's hands. And I asked them, I said, when you hold that ball in your hand, what does your heart and soul say? And uh, the responses have been amazing. Um, and so I made a whole, I, 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 I cut all of those together and I made a film called 108 Stitches. And it's people age nine to 95. Uh, talking about what a baseball means to them when they when you hold the ball in your hand it, there's, there's something special that goes on with that so anyhow Doug thanks for that yeah I still hold baseballs once in a while so it's that was that's that surprised me I didn't know it was coming and uh, you had to think on your feet <laughs> all right uh Chad Hey, thanks a lot, John. This is fantastic, man. And thank you to the uh, Sabre community, man, for the invite. Um, man, I, I, I can't believe after, you know, uh, how Lefty O'Doul is not in the Hall of Fame. It's just incredible to me. Um, I used to love going to Lefties when I lived in San Francisco. 
uh, just the history, just roaming the walls and uh, just talking to baseball people, having a great corned beef sandwich. Uh, I certainly miss those times, man. Um, as a, a former uh, Little League coach in San Francisco, uh, they let us use this hat uh, here um, when, with our all-star team. Um, the SEALs did and uh, Lefty uh, had a, a contribution. Uh, his family had a contribution in that. So I'll never forget that. Um, as a, uh, my question is, um, as a baseball coach down here in Chile, um, we are starting a, uh, we did start a Little League down here, sanctioned Little League. Um, and it is just fantastic to, um, you know, be a part of that. But also, um, you know, we are now starting a women's league down here. And, and with your, and with your, um, uh, with your, with your documentary shutout, um, I haven't watched it yet. I'm looking forward to that, but I'm interested. I, just a question. What struck you most? Um, when I speak to young ladies here, you know, they don't, they, they, they see baseball and, but they don't know too much about it. So we teach a little bit to them about it, but I imagine, I guess what I'm getting at is like, what struck you when you made that documentary, uh, with Justine, I've talked to on Twitter a little bit, um, and, uh, you know, what struck you most about that documentary? Where do you think it's going, the momentum um, with, uh, women's, uh, with women's sports and um, getting equivalent coverage when it comes to uh, not only baseball, but other sports? I, I just, you know, with your experience, I'd like to know what was the biggest uh, thing that you got out of uh, shooting that documentary? And thank you for doing so, man. And thanks for the vine. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chad. A lot of meat on that bone there. Um, so the thing that struck me the most was I, what a deep, dark roots, what a complicated and complex story it is. Um, and uh, even today, I mean, after I made the film, I tried to share it with like gender studies uh, programs at universities all up and down the West Coast. Not one of them, not one of them was interested in uh, exploring it. I talked to a woman who was a senior producer at ESPN. I said, why aren't you guys talking about this? Heck, you know, the NFL and the NBA have had women refereeing for years now. Major League Baseball is, as, as always, uh, behind the eight ball, with a glacial pace uh, with respect to this thing. She said, there's too much money at stake. He said, but this story is really important and you should, you should keep telling it. And, um, you know, it, it's there's a lot of crossed wires socially with this because there are some really conservative women. Justine Siegel said some of the worst heckling she ever got from the stands was from women. What are you doing out there? You don't belong out there. So, um, as I say, this is a story with deep, dark, tangled roots. I brought the film and showed it a bunch of libraries uh, around the country. It's been shown in Cooperstown. I had so many women come up to me in their 50s and 60s and said, I was every bit as good a baseball player as those boys. And they ran me off the field. And you could see, you could hear the heartbreak, you know, and it's like, this is just about people chasing their hopes and dreams. It's not about, will they ever get to play major league baseball? That's always where this discussion goes. It's not about that. You know, half of our population is, had been discouraged from participating in its national pastime. And that includes coaching and umpiring. So I, I made the film to, to shine a light on this issue. Major League Baseball is still does not have a female umpire, even though 10 of them just retired. You know, when are they gonna wake up and, and, and address this issue? Heck, they should hire Perry Barber to be an umpire. Here she is. But anyhow, um, but I think that was the thing that really struck me because it was that, um, that it was just these roots ran so deep and so dark and, and are so complex. Uh, and of course, it's a very accurate reflection of what's going on in our country. We still have massive issues with equality, people of color and women. Um, but I think that is, a, I thought that this was a really good opportunity to put that out there uh, because baseball means so much to everybody and it's our national pastime. And it's great to see there have definitely been inroads um, more girls are making boys traditional high school teams. We see more women getting coaching opportunities in minor league baseball and on, on major league teams. They've really infiltrated 
uh, major league scouting, uh, scouting for, for major league teams, which has been great to see. We don't see much, many women involved in ownership. We see very few at the top of the ladder. I think we have one, Kim Ng, as a general manager. And, um, you know, uh, and Major League Baseball needs to do a lot more to reach out and engage girls and women to play and enjoy baseball. Thank you very much, John. Uh, next up, we got Mike. Thanks, Zach. And uh, uh, thank you in particular to John. And uh, John, I, I that's awesome that you did uh, ball four after 40 years. But I, I want to ask you in particular, you picked out one of my childhood heroes. And um, in, uh, in the case of uh, Mudcat Grant, and, and kind of drill down and see why you picked him over other black players. And I, I didn't know this about you, but that you grew up work, uh, near and uh, working at uh, Candlestick Park. I grew up watching Mudcat and we used to sneak into the Twins games. And then I ended up working, uh, ended up working at the uh, old Met Stadium there in Bloomington from 1969 to 1973 until I joined the military. But I'm curious as to why you picked out one of my favorite all-time pitchers, Mudcat Grant, um, relating to racism and, and how black players were treated over some of the other more famous ones. I'm glad you did, because those of us that grew up in the heartland uh, often felt ignored when stuff like that came up. But anyway, thank you for all you do. You're welcome. I chose Mudcat because I saw him speak at a baseball reliquary event where he was being inducted into their shrine of the eternal sort of their version of the hall of fame and he told a story how he was dating a white lady uh in the pacific coast league when he played for the san diego padres who were the minor league uh, affiliate of the cleveland indians and um he was called into the office and they said we understand you're dating a white lady he said that's right he said that doesn't happen in the big leagues they basically said you're not allowed um, and, uh, you know, he wanted to go to Mexico and marry her. And she said, no, it'll ruin your career. They went their separate ways. Um, and then they both got married to different people. One of them died. He got divorced and they got, he, so they ended up getting together again and they lived happily ever after. It was a wonderful story. And I, you know, because of his background as a broadcaster, uh, he's a wonderful storyteller, um, and he's probably one of the sweetest people I think I've ever met in my entire life. Um, he was kind enough. He let, so, I mean, that was the reason why. And because he had seen, you know, he was, he was, you know, one of the few black starting pitchers, certainly in the American League and, and in both leagues through, I think his first year was 59. And um, so he had some very unique experiences and he was very nice. He, he invited me and my cameraman into his home. Usually my interviews will, will, will go for about an hour. And, uh, you know, and he was getting up in age. This was in the summer of 2016. He died in 2020. Um, and after about an hour, I said, you know, are, are, are you, you're running out of gas. You, you want to wrap it up? He goes, oh, no. So he talked for like two and a half hours and just spun absolute gold. More stories after more stories. I ended up making four different films with Mudcat. The, the principal one being Race Ball, which is about 45 minutes. There's another one called Breakfast with JFK. Um, there's another one about when he went to Vietnam during the Vietnam War, a really poignant story there. And then he, uh, there's one uh, made with him talking about the secret pitches he learned from Satchel Paige, uh, none of which were legal. Um, but in any case, um, that's why I decided to um, interview Mudcat and talk with him about it. Of course, I read his book, The Black Aces, which, of course, talks a lot about racism and prejudice in Major League Baseball. Um, but I hope you all get a chance to watch that film in particular, Race Ball. Um, it's, if you go to uh, Vimeo uh, and go Vimeo on demand, the sweet spot, you can find it there. And um, you'll be shocked by some of the stuff that you hear that he went through. He's a very classy guy. He didn't do a lot of like naming names and stuff, but um, but he's a wonderful guy. And uh, it was such a privilege to, and an honor to meet him and become friends with him. I was I was honored to go to his funeral when he passed uh, in June of 2020. And right behind me was his teammate from the Cleveland Indians, Gary Bell. 
and they were the first black and white MLB players to room together. And they had been friends for something like 65 years. It was really sweet. All right, John. Well, thank you very much. Um, do we have, uh, we're into the next hour. Um, so before we pass it over to Steve and Rob, do we have any last questions for John? All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, great, great presentation. I'm glad to, um, you know, of all the work that you're doing. It's been a, a great find on Amazon. Um, YouTube too, ha I've seen some stuff. Um, definitely look John up, um, support his work because he's doing, he's doing great stuff. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over uh, to my counterpart uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, technically, I guess Scottsdale or Tucson today. Tucson. Um, Steve Ryder, who will introduce Rob. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Zach. Uh, John, that was marvelous as always. Um, Rob Fitz is here today. If, if those of you who are not familiar with Rob Fitz's work, uh, you're in for a treat. <clears throat> there probably is a more knowledgeable scholar and prolific writer on the subject of Japanese baseball than Rob Fitz, but if so, that person is Japanese. <laughs> there is no more knowledgeable scholar or prolific writer on the subject of Japanese baseball who speaks English and who's an American than Rob Fitz is. Um, he's specifically here today because he has got yet another new book coming out <clears throat> this spring on the subject of American baseball teams touring Japan, the long history of that. Um, and we will talk about that, that book today, but before we get to that book, I want to just sort of uh, allow people to get to know who Rob is and, and, and how he got to be um, writing this particular book. I met Rob uh, probably about 10 years ago, the first time, when I was doing my early research on my book about Horace Stoneham. And one of the most interesting, of the many interesting things in Horace Stoneham's life was his recruiting Masanori Murakami to come play for the Giants. And so I thought, well, a good way to sort of get a little research done on this is I'll do a, I'll do a presentation at the Nine Conference about the whole Masanori Murakami uh, episode in Giants history. And so while I'm doing this, Rob was a fellow presenter at the conference and he said, hey, I'm also doing some research on Murakami, you know, make sure we 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 don't overlap here. And of course it took me about five minutes to realize that Rob knew 500 times more about Masanori and Murakami than I was ever gonna learn. Um, and he was just such a generous, uh, you know, uh, sharer of information and he helped me out immensely um, in that regard. So Rob, by way of introducing you here to the to the group, please tell us you're a New Yorker. You're you're you still live in New York. You're you're not Japanese. How is it that you, Rob Fitz from New York, came to be such a great uh, scholar of Japan, Japanese history, and Japanese baseball? Well, I blame my wife for all that. Uh, my wife Sarah was a Japanese history major in college. She spent her senior year in high school in Japan as an exchange student. She's a fluent speaker. And uh, she went off to law school. I was supposed to enjoy a nice quiet life as an American archaeologist. And about three years after we were married, uh, her law firm transferred her to Tokyo. And, uh, you know, I have had a choice stay in the United States by myself for a while, or go join her. And the first night I, I do the flight, which it's those of you who've taken it, it's 13 hours from New York City, and it's, you know, it's uncomfortable. I arrived without sleep, completely jet lagged, got in the hotel, showered, and I'm all ready to go to bed. And my wife comes back from the office and she says, We have box seat tickets to a Japanese baseball game that our firm gave us. You know, we have to go get dressed, we're going. And uh we sat and watched in Meiji Jingu Stadium, the Yakult Swallows play the Hanshin Tigers. And my wife, uh, my life was changed that night, really. Because those of you who have been to a Japanese baseball game, it's kind of like a Big Ten football or basketball game. There are cheering groups, there's horns playing, there's there's uh, songs going on. And the shady stadiums come down and shake with the noise and the uh, the rhythms being pounded out when you're watching these games. And it was just 
absolutely amazing. So that night, I was already an American baseball fan, but I'm like, oh my, all right. I know what I'm gonna do for the next year while we're living in Japan. I'm gonna learn everything we, I can about Japanese baseball. And I started the next morning, I went out in search of Japanese baseball cards. And it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> um, it didn't take, I think I lasted maybe uh, five years or so as an archeologist and then I quit and decided to spend uh, what's become now over 20 years uh, studying and writing about Japanese baseball. Well, the discipline of archaeology may be poorer for it, but the rest of us are glad you did that. Um, and we will talk about baseball cards. You're not going to get out of here without talking about baseball cards, too, because I know that's another passion of yours. But your first book um, th that you published on the subject of Japanese baseball was an oral history, um, sort of the glory of their times only, only from Japanese players. To tell us a little bit about that. Well, of course, it's modeled after Glory of Their Time, which is my favorite uh, baseball book. What happened was I was collecting Japanese baseball cards. That's how I really entered um, the field of writing. And I opened up a website way back in 1999 to sell Japanese baseball cards. And the hard part was how do you get Americans to learn about Japanese baseball cards? How do you get them to know what to collect and to spend money on these things? So I thought what I would do is write a series of articles and kind of player biographies um, to introduce Americans to the greatest Japanese ball players. And the problem I had was I don't read Japanese. Matter of fact, I don't really speak Japanese. I can you know, kind of get by when I get over there for ordering meals. Um, so I couldn't just go out and get books to, to read up on it. And I read everything there was in English. And this is really before the internet took off. So I couldn't get hold of old newspapers the way we can now. So the solution I had was, why don't I start interviewing American ballplayers who played in Japan and ask them about what it was like to play in Japan, but more importantly, who their teammates were and what their teammates were like. And these I started collecting these stories just for myself and then I'm like wow no this is this is great this is a book and of course glory their times came right instantly to mind um so I started collecting these um oral you know narratives of the players lives and how they ended up in Japan and what it was like from them and I edited them just like glory of the times so I took out all my own questions um I would interview players for several hours often, sometimes for five or six hours over different days. And then I'd bring it together into about 3000 words or so that really captured the, the narrative. So that was the first book. And um, I had so much fun that by the time I had sent it off to the publisher, the first draft, I said, okay, this is what I'm doing with my life. You know, and I'd already picked the second book at that point. So you know what I was going to work on. Well, your segue is brilliant because I definitely want to talk about your second book, which is which is a biography of Wally Yonanime. Am I pronouncing that right? Wally Yonanime, yeah. who, uh, if he's not familiar to we Bay Area people, he should be. Wally Yonanime played for the San Francisco 49ers. This is this is a Bay Area sports hero who was also a remarkable figure in Japanese baseball. Tell us a little bit about about Wally. Well, Wally was born and brought up in um, Hawaii in Maui, um, and he was one of the greatest athletes ever to come out of Hawaii. And he played all three sports through high school and football. He was a hero in, in Hawaii, best player in Hawaii at the time. And um, he played, I'm trying to remember, he played for a, um, an amateur team coming out of Honolulu that was touring the West Coast of, of California, toward California. And the scouts from San Francisco saw him play and recruited him. And instead of going to college to, uh, to play football, he came in and started playing for the 49ers. And this is 1947. And I'm sure most people know that on the West Coast, Japanese Americans were interred for World War II. So you have 100,000 people coming out of internment camps, integrating back into California society, and there's a Japanese American on the 49ers. So he became more than just a player. He was a, a symbol of reintegration. He became a sports hero. Now, unfortunately for Wally, his 
potential didn't really uh, come to fruition within the, the, uh, the professional baseball. He had a rough year. He ended up not being the starting um, halfback that they expected him to be. And he only lasted one year, the 49ers. And during the off season, um, after the 47 year, he ended up breaking um, an arm and he couldn't really come back at a full enough level to make the 49ers for his second year. And then he moved into professional baseball, starting minor league baseball. His story is exactly interesting that, that you know, he's a, he's a, a great champion athlete, but also right in the center of this, of this fraught subject of, of Japanese, American Japanese, uh, you know, American born Japanese in California and Hawaii and the West Coast in that period, which was extremely complicated and, and difficult. Um, and we're still sort of, you know, seeing the repercussions of it to this day. Your next book was on the subject of Mashi Murakami, uh, who uh, was the first uh, Japanese player to play in the American Major Leagues for the Giants in 1964 and 65. Um, I suspect most people here are a little bit familiar with that, but but make sure everybody knows who, who Masanori Murakami was, or still is. I want to backtrack just a little bit, Steve. So I just told you about Wally on the 49ers, but after he entered baseball, he went off to Japan and he became the first major American star to play professional baseball in Japan. Um, he ended up in the Japanese Hall of Fame, uh, played for the Yomiuri Giants for, for a decade, ended up managing and coaching. Um, so had an incredibly long career in Japan. So I've written at this point, the, the story of the first American to come to Japan well, naturally, I turn to Mashi Murakami, who becomes the that first is. Japanese to play in the major league. So the two books, in a way, are, are parallel stories. Um, and Mashi was part of my very first book, the, the oral tradition book. I interviewed him in Tokyo. And during the few hours I spent with him, I really, um, really liked him. He, he's one of the nicest people out there. And I said, wow, his story is fantastic. Fabulous. He he's willing to to share emotions. He's he's. It was not your usual baseball interview of you know this is my favorite day on the field. Um, this is my most memorable moment when I hit a home run. He really got into uh, it. How how his soul was altered when he went to the United States and it changed his life. And then he was forced to come back to Japan. Um, so. It didn't, it, uh, by the time, end, time, end of the interview, I knew I had a wonderful book here. It's just, could I possibly get it down on paper? And uh, so we spent, I would say about two years getting the book together, multiple interviews of, of going to Japan several, about three times, um, interviewing for a week at a time, every morning, we break for lunch, have to do a couple hours in the afternoons and then take off, start again the next day, telephone interviews. Now, Japan, um, well, I'm sorry, Mashi's English is pretty good, but he cannot interview in English. Um, or if he does, he really has to prep. So I had to use a simultaneous translator for all of these um, interviews and then get back and um, transcribe everything and often call the, um, the interviewer and say, okay, you know, could you listen to this tape again and, and make sure we got what Mashi says right. So it, it's a long process of doing it in Japanese and English. One of the things about Murakami's story, which uh, is so interesting, is you know he he came to the United States. The, the Giants uh, recruited Murakami along with three other Japanese minor leaguers, kids, um, just basically for the experience of having them do spring training and then spend a year in in American minor league baseball. But just basically as a, not just a publicity thing, but, you know, a goodwill thing. It would be good experience for these Japanese players to help them be better players in Japan. It would be good publicity for the, for the Giants minor leaguers. But then they were startled to find out that one of these kids, this Murakami kid, this left-handed pitcher, he was really, really good. He wasn't just really, really good for a minor league player. He, he absolutely torched the California League in the one season the Giants had him down there. And so they brought him immediately up to the majors. And he was 
a superb pitcher at the major league level for a year, a year and change that he was in the American League, American baseball before going back to Japan. He, he, he had a good career in Japan, but he never became the, the superstar that he, it, it appeared he, he might. Is that, does he share that? Is he a little bit disappointed about how his baseball career turned out? Well, absolutely. I mean, he wanted to stay in the United States and was forced back to Japan. But in the States, he was used as a rep, uh, left-handed reliever and where he was so dominant. When he gets back to Japan, he's, of course, the only Japanese major leaguer, and he excelled at it. So they think, OK, here we have the greatest Japanese pitcher of all time. Well, let's turn him into a starter. Let's make him our ace. And he's 21 years old. Um, I think maybe 22 at, by that point. Um, and now he's turned into a starter who's expected to pitch 200 plus innings and he's expected to dominate, you know, veteran Japanese batters. Well, su not surprisingly, he doesn't. Um, and the media gets on his case right away. It became extremely hostile. You know, why aren't you the star you're supposed to be? What is what it's got to be your fault. Why aren't you trying hard enough? You know, uh, what, what, what's your what's your issue? Um, and he's a kid and he reacts mentally poorly. It gets to him and he has trouble really settling down, focusing on playing baseball. But he's trying so hard and he hurts his arm. He's overthrowing. He's trying to throw every ball hard and he's not a power pitcher to begin with. Um, and he starts having a series of arm problems. And the medical knowledge in the United States was not that great back then. And in Japan, it was worse. The solution in Japanese baseball was, well, if your arm hurts, it must be weak. Mm -hmm. So you got to pitch more. And so they would exercise them more. They would pitch more until basically he, we don't know what was wrong with it. Uh, I mean, whether because uh, he never got a true diagnosis, but it, he really wrecked up his arm. And he had some good seasons. He became an all-star once or twice. And he managed to survive, I think, 15 seasons in Japan and hit 200 wins which is pretty significant. But yeah, he was never the superstar he should have been if he was used in the reliever role and maybe gradually as he got older and stronger moved into the starting role. And he is disappointed about that, yes, but he's not bitter. He's sad, but not bitter. And that's one of the really great things about Mashi. So you talk to him and, and he's not angry about it. It's just like, that's the way life went, wow. That's a shame. <laughs> Which to me, I think that's part of the great story. Is that such a fascinating story? And it's not, you know, a heroic journey of this marvelous star, although he certainly had success as a player. It's more of the the struggle, the journey, the career, the life uh, that 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 he forged in baseball. It's a it's a it's a remarkable story. A great book if 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 you haven't caught it yet. Your next book after that was on the subject of Issei baseball. That is Americans, Japanese, uh, American-born Japanese playing uh, baseball in the United States in earlier decades. Um, tell us about that book. That book started, and I should have thought of this before. I'm going to get up and grab something, or maybe I'll just hold up the, uh, the laptop here. All right. So if you see, can you see um, this kind of baseball card here, or, or is the glare too bad? Sort of see it. Sort of see, you it. see that you're pointing at something. <laughs> That's not very good. Let's take it out and look at it back on the. Uh... All right. So this card right here. Now, can we see that? Yeah, sort of. It's, it's got a lot of glare, I can say. It's a team picture of some Japanese fellas. And on their uniform, it says JBB Association. I picked up this card on eBay, I'd say almost 20 years ago. And I had no idea what it was. I knew a fair amount about Japanese baseball cards at that point. I knew it was unusual. And it, it went for not much money at all. I grabbed it. I was like, now I have to research what this is. And 
I did a little research. I called uh, Kerio, Kerio Nakagawa, who's kind of the expert on Japanese American baseball. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. And he did a little research and they sent me some photocopies. It showed me it was a team from 1911 of Issei, which are Japanese who have moved to another country, first generation translates to, baseball players that traveled around the United States Midwest as a semi-pro or professional barnstorming team. That's cool. I put it aside. I did my other books and always meant, you know, I'd like to go back to that at some point. So I'm doing the research for Mashi and a chapter that ended up being cut from the draft was who were the first Japanese players to play professional baseball in the United States, not the major leagues, but semi-pro uh, minor league balls. And I came back to this team and an even earlier team of 1906. It was a professional barnstorming team of all Japanese players. And I said, wow, you know, these are something I didn't know. Here's something that actually, if you went and Googled it, nobody knew, you know, it came up zero. So I decided this was going to be a book because I wanted to write the book. And I think I told uh, Rob Taylor in Nebraska and he's like, that's not gonna sell. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't. Um, but this is a book I wanted to write for me, whether it sold three copies or not. And so I spent five years researching these Japanese barnstorming teams and the very early days of Japanese American baseball. So we're talking 1903 through 1912, 1913, the book focuses on. And it follows the lives of these uh, Japanese men in Japan where they learned baseball playing high school baseball in Japan and then they immigrated to the United States around 1903 1904 and by 1906 they're playing on a professional barnstorming baseball team organized by a fellow named Guy Green who was the owner of the Nebraska Indians one of the biggest barnstorming teams in the early 20th century team only lasted one year disbanded but the Japanese players loved the life and they created their own amateur teams and then they created very short-lived other professional barnstorming teams. Um, so this book is their story. It's a really a four-way biography. I focus on four or maybe even four and a half players from the time they were born, they, where they learned baseball in Japan, their immigration, their immigration story is people, not just baseball players, then the healthy chunk of the book talks about the baseball teams. And in the end of the book, I talk about what happens when they got older, what they did. Most of them were incarcerated during World War II. One was arrested as a spy and actually thrown in prison, not just the camps. Um, and I talk about that experience and then what happened after they got out of camps and what their attitudes were. All of the fellows had passed away by the time I started this book. And even their children were in their 80s. But I was able to interview their children. And a couple of the players wrote uh, small little memoirs, you know, like 10 page papers that they gave to their children uh, way back in the 70s. So I had some of their stories uh, still. And I was able to get back and use their own words. So for me, even though I may be the only one who cares, it's one of perhaps my favorite book because I feel that I really enjoyed the research and got to know a story that hadn't been told before. And you preserved forever uh, a story that may well have been lost uh, without your without your capturing it. And there's just so many layers of complicated interactive meaning in all this these stories. So that's wonderful. That brings us to your latest book. But before we get to that, Chad, you have your hand up. You have a question or comment? I do. And I hope this isn't uh... Uh, impeding on the conversation, but Mr. Fitz, man, I, you got me, you got me thinking so much about Japanese baseball and I'm a baseball card collector. All right. So um, I, 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 I remember I brought a bunch of cards down here with me to Chile and I have some Japanese baseball cards and, and I don't know who they are of exactly. Um, I don't know if I can show them on here, but um, they're, I mean, they're, such as this here. That's a San Francisco seal, as you probably know, yep. from 1949. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's called a Menko card. I, I can't tell yep. you who the player is off the top right. of my head. 
Yeah, okay. I just thought it was relevant <laughs> to the conversation. So I thought that it would be pretty interesting to. That looks like, could you see the back? Yeah. It's also, that's uh, also from 1949, same set. Obviously, I guess one of the Japanese players who played in the all-star team against him. And, and we can talk about that a little Very bit. Very cool. All right, man. All right. Excellent. All right. Sorry for the interruption. No, I, that's, thought that's, that's I thought it was relevant. And I'm like, wow, this is a fantastic opportunity yeah. to speak it, to a per to speak to a man who knows so much about this. I picked these off of eBay like a couple of years ago because I because I just found them so interesting. And I just love the whole story with the San Francisco Seals and and everything like that. So thanks for thanks for allowing me a little bit little bit of time. I thought I'd show them up. So it's it's perfect baseball cards is sort of the that was the the window that got rob interested in all the and baseball cards that, that you know they they cross all boundaries that everybody around the world who who loves baseball loves baseball cards and probably that was a, a way when we were young how we began to to learn about this okay so rob before we talk about the baseball tours uh books let's let's talk about your interest in in baseball card um, collecting, and in particular, the Japanese baseball cards compared to the American baseball cards market? Sure. Well, I started collecting in 1975 as a kid, um, and I collected up until eh, probably junior high, when I stopped for a number of years, and, and then started collecting again when I was in graduate school. And... Uh, once again, this was my wife's fault. You know, she's responsible for every good thing in my life. And uh, I was in graduate school. We were driving up to Syracuse to visit her family. And she's, her uh, sister said, let's stop at Cooperstown. And I'm like, I don't want to do that, really. Let's just do the drive. She's like, no, 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 we got to stop. Well, Cooperstown, going to Cooperstown when I was, I guess I was about maybe 25, probably a little younger, 24 rekindled my old passion for baseball i'd been there as a kid i remembered it I, I spent you know hours going through the museum until i think they had to force me to leave and the next day i was back looking for baseball cards again and uh trying to uh collect the latest players to to get back into the game to teach myself who were the stars and uh 1989 bo jackson was the was actually the player we all cared about um so that was back into American baseball cards. When I went over to Japan in 1993, like I said, my second day there, my first full day, we started. I started looking for Japanese baseball cards and found a few boxes, bought them, opened them up, and uh, very quickly went into the older cards. Uh, there were no base. There was only one baseball card shop in all of Japan at that time, so you had to get your old cards the way you used to, which is flea markets and antique stores and you own antique stores and there'd be you know beautiful vases and old fancy antiques and somewhere down the bottom were postcards and some baseball cards that they practically gave you you know because they're junk and for the real antique collector and so i would spend a lot of my free time traveling around tokyo to old antique shops um just junk shops too and and picking up the cards um and when I get back to the United States, I found there was a community of, say, about 40 people back then who were collecting Japanese baseball cards. And we became friends with just about every one of them. And we started swapping. And then the Internet came along. And that, of course, changed everything. And we could actually get them again and uh, made ties to Japan. That led to a business in uh, about 2001. Um, I actually, well, it was actually it was earlier than that, but um, about 1999, I started a business where I actually went to Japan twice a year to buy baseball cards and brought them back and started selling them on the internet and trading them with friends. And that, of course, led to the baseball books, as I already talked about. The baseball cards, once again, it's, it's one of these things, it, it seems simple, but it's such a complicated thing. There's so many ways in which baseball cards, um, you know, help us to understand the game. One of them, which you helped me out, I thought was very interesting. Years ago, I made a presentation at the Nine Conference on the subject of Mel Ott and his career and his and his legacy. And the, the, the hypothesis I was presenting was that Mel Ott in his day was was understood to be one of the very greatest players in history. Um, and he was a huge superstar in New York. You know, everybody knew who Mel Ott was. But, you know, over the decades since, um, 
he's not as well remembered as his contemporaries guys. He was, he was, he was as great a player as Lou Gehrig and Joe DiMaggio, you know, Bob Feller and those players, but, but he's not today known as well. That was, that was my, my hypothesis, but it was just a subjective, you know, opinion I had. I didn't have any way to really, uh, uh, manifest that to, to 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 quantify it but rob said i can tell you how to figure that out what's the value of mel Ott card today compared to the value of these other players and and through rob's data <laughs> the, the next version of the presentation i gave it's at saber in the summertime i got in mel Ott's baseball card value it's it's just a way of, of you know the baseball cards give us a window into the the public perception of a of a of a great star Exactly. And Sabre now has a baseball card committee that's starting to get into the, I don't know, we'll call it the academic study of baseball cards. So, something I actually started in the 1990s. My first, one of my first published papers was called The Archaeology of Baseball Cards. And I talked about um, how baseball cards did not depict or ignore the Negro Leagues on the backs of the early Black players. And uh, I so, somehow got some archaeology journal to publish it. That took a lot of finagling. Um, so yeah, it's great to see baseball cards being taken seriously as a, a cultural artifact and something to be studied now. So I'm sure there's be a lot more coming out. Good. Well, that brings us to your latest book, actually a two volume a book. The first volume is being published this spring, if I'm first correct. It's actually already out. It's already out. And yeah. this is on the subject of American teams touring Japan. Tell us about this, this book project. Well, I'm holding up the front cover here, which is, does it come out backwards? No, I think we can see it. We can see see it. it. It's backwards in my screen. Okay. Um, so it's Nichi Bay Yakyu. I can barely pronounce my own title. U.S. Tours of Japan. That's basically Japanese for uh, Japan American Baseball. And uh, from 1907 until 2019, there's over a hundred American, North American or Hawaiian teams that cross the Pacific to play in Japan. And this book, uh, the book two volume set is a Sabre publication. It's done by uh, Sabre authors, some of whom I can see their faces right now or here today. Um, and what we've done, we focused on roughly 60 of these hundred tours all the professional tours, a number of the collegiate and the amateur and, and semi-pro tours to tell the story both of international relations through baseball, of Japanese baseball history and of the tour. So the idea is that they're published, you know, sequentially, first chapters 1907, next one's 1908, you know, and so on. So by reading this, the idea is you can learn about Japanese baseball history, a little bit about world history, certainly about the tour history, about the different Japanese stars, because who do the Americans play? They play the best in Japan. So it's a way to introduce uh, Sabre members who may know nothing about Japanese baseball and may not care, but if they want to know how Willie Mays did in Japan, they've got to read it. Right? And then they start figuring out, oh, okay, Sadahara, oh, Shigeo Nagashima, these great Japanese players, and to introduce them to these players. So that's kind of what's behind it. The first volume, 1907 to 1958, came out in December. Second volume, I'm still working on. It should be out this summer, at latest this fall. Um, it will, second volume will also have statistical tables of all the players who played in these tournaments. So you'll be able to see how they did in each tour. And in the final chapter, you'll get to see who the leaders are throughout all the tours who hit the most home runs against Americans. It was Sadahara O, oh, who had the highest batting average. It was Sadahara O, oh, uh, et cetera. It's always Sadahara O. Oh. And um, I think we'll do some uh, career stats too. So you look at O's and Nagashima's and Ichiro's and Matsui's, how they did every single year against the American visitors. So very excited about this. It's been a lot of work with uh, 50 different authors from Sabre, uh, some first-time authors, some award-winning authors. Um, so it's been um, a bit of a challenge, but it's been a wonderful two years doing this. And uh, yeah, I hope everybody enjoys it. 
the, one of the things about the American tours of Japan is it 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 brings right to the forefront sort of the cultural clash and the cultural you know uh, blend between Americans and Japanese. Um, the, the American the experience of the American players playing mm -hmm. in Japan um, is you know kind of stunning to them. Um, it. it, it <clears throat> The, the baseball is is sort of the way in which these two cultures come to see one another f f in, in a fresh new way. As, I, as you as always, it, it's a prism into into a bunch of interesting things that we never would have thought about otherwise. Yeah, one of the things we try to do is is with with so many different authors, the authors took different approaches, but we try to when we set this out is to really emphasize. Um, the cultural, the diplomatic aspects of these tours. So, so Dennis here has written on several chapters, but one of the best chapters in the book is his chapter on Lefty O'Doul's 1949 baseball tour. And yeah, you can read it and see who won game three and who was the winning pitcher and who hit the home runs, but that's not the point. The point of his chapter is how Lefty O'Doul brought the two countries closer together after World War II and he healed so many wounds through baseball. And there are many chapters take that tact and look at the diplomatic aspects of baseball or the cultural misunderstandings for some of the tours that did not go well, because they weren't all a success. Uh, very famous Philadelphia Bobbies tour in the uh, late 1920s, a player died on the way home. They were left, they were abandoned in Japan by their sponsor. And the young women had to get home any way they could. And, and one of them was washed overboard on the way home. Uh, chapter I wrote on Native American teams, they were both abandoned in Japan and they had to get home any way they could and ended up having to borrow money. And eventually people just bought them tickets and said, get back you know, to the West Coast. You, know, you can't stay here anymore. Um, so there's many different stories in this book um, about the, not just what happens on the field, but really what happens off the field, which is far the more interesting part of these tours. And, and uh, I myself have the honor of being a contributing author to one of the chapters in the, in, the, in the second book, which is the 1970, spring 1970 tour, the San Francisco Giants tour Japan. And I, it was, I was delighted to be able to, to do this because I remember this. I was, a, I was a kid in the spring of 1970, a Giants fan. And the, the, the Giants tour was unsuccessful would be too strong of a word, but it wasn't, it wasn't a rousing success. The Giants struggled to win games in Japan. One of the things that, that, that comes true in this series of tours is how much the Jap, the, the quality of Japanese plays is rapidly improving in this period. The Giants go over there thinking this is going to be a quick, easy two weeks. And they, they get their butts kicked by the Japanese and, uh, you know, it really was one of the turning points, I think, of understanding that this is no longer just a, a, a quaint little back, backwater here. These guys can really, really play. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that is basically the, one of the themes of the book, that when we worked on these chapters as editors, we always said, all right, we need to emphasize a little bit more on this chapter, you know, how are the Japanese doing versus the Americans? And it's not a straight line. It's, you know, you can't, you, you actually you can graph the batting averages and see the Japanese batting averages going up and the, uh, the American ERA going up. But there's dips. There's a lot of um, both ups and downs. In 1990, the Japanese won most of the games for the first time in history. So in 1992, MLB sent a true, like, all-star team of all it was loaded with Hall of Famers and they won almost all the games and they just had to prove a point. So there's tension in some of these uh, games. The Americans don't like to lose. They are playing. They're not playing all out. You know, it's not the World Series, but they're playing to win. The Japanese, are, for the most part, are playing all out and because they really have something to prove. Individual players are using this as a way to um, audition for potential major league contracts. Um, at times. But even that, what I just said, it's more complex than that because we have some tours in the later things where the Japanese are like, we've already won. We won the World Baseball Classic twice. 
we're not going to use our best players against you anymore. We don't need to. So it's a complicated situation. And I think it's brought out in a lot of these chapters. And so it may not be a book you read cover to cover, but I think people who will pick this up can pick chapters and really get some enjoyment out of a 5,000 word chapter um, about uh, the interaction between these two cultures through baseball. Well, it's a marvelous book. Yet a, the, the latest just in your long line of really remarkable uh, uh, explorations of Japanese baseball and America, the American understanding and experience of Japanese baseball, how we, how we see that through our cultural lens. Um, this would be a good time to open the floor up for others who might have questions or comments for Rob on any of the subjects we've talked about. So I see Dennis, you have your hand up, you get to go first. Thanks. Uh, and thanks Rob for allowing me to be able to do some couple chapters on this too. I really appreciated the opportunity. Hey, I wanted to ask you a question, one book that wasn't mentioned so far and is probably my favorite book on a uh, of yours and of Japanese baseball is Bonsai Babe Ruth. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Bonsai Babe Ruth uh, focuses on the 1934 tour of Japan, which featured one of the greatest American teams of all time, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Jimmy Fox. Um, was it, oh, now of course blanking on all their great players, but, uh, and of course, Mo Berg and his supposed uh, spying. Um, what, I found when I started doing research is there was also an attempted coup d'etat by the Jap an aspect of the Japanese military during this tour. And so when I found that out, the idea to write a book that is a baseball book and hopefully a little bit of a thriller. So I break the chapters up into baseball chapters, chapters on the Japanese military. There's an assassination of the organizer of the tour that happens a few months after the tour. So the assassin gets chapters too. And the idea is to create some tension between a baseball tour that's going just wonderfully and these undercurrents in Japanese history, which of course lead to World War II. Um, so that's the, that's the book in, in two minutes. And Lefty O'Doul himself, of course, was a, of course was a very important part of that, of that tour. Uh, Mike Slocum. Thanks for helping me out, and thank you for your your uh, uh, books, Robert. Um, my question, and you already mentioned his name two or three times, but when I was stationed at a uh, Marine Corps air station over in Okinawa, and I worked with these Okinawan civilians, mostly almost entirely men, and they were all, of course, huge baseball fans, and when they found out that I grew up a couple blocks away from a, a Major League Baseball park myself, we became instant friends and we, we talked more baseball than anything else, but they would, um, they would talk about this guy named, and I learned who he was, but they would refer to him as Mr. O this and Mr. O that. And I, I, you know, I'd been over there six months before I knew his first name talking about Sadahiro O of course. And, and I'm curious as to how, if you're, an uh, expert on on uh, uh, Japanese baseball cards, how much would a Sada Hero O baseball card or like rookie card be worth now? And his his Mr. O, as I always thought of him because of these Okinawan men that I worked with, has his legend grown or has it diminished? Or And, and one last real quick question that how accurate was the uh, Tom Selleck movie, Mr. Baseball, in, in capturing the culture. Okay. Well, the we'll tackle, we'll tackle the really good. Part. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you asked me this before COVID, I would have said, yeah, call me later and I'll sell you a Satahara O rookie card for 300 bucks. And I would have been like, sucker. <laughs> right? Now, right. Satahara O rookie cards are going for a couple thousand in decent condition. Um, you might be able to find a beat up one for $900, $800. A high condition one, uh, one sold for $65,000 earlier this year. 
in wow. near mint condition. Um, so what that shows, going back to Steve's study of Mel Ott's baseball cards, is yes, Satahara O is known from American collectors. And these prices are Americans who are paying this, this money. Um, he's well known as what the greatest slugger in Japanese baseball history. And he is revered in the United States. Um, so that's the answer, the quick answer to your question there. For the Tom Selleck movie, there is a great article that was published, I would say a month ago, maybe two months ago, um, by um, Brad Lefton from the New York Times. And it, it answers that question. And I'll just briefly give it, it is a very accurate with Hollywood drama thrown in. Uh, what the writer did was he went over there, he had a script, he met with um, the Lee brothers. I think, I can't remember if he met with Lee Ron or, or Leon Lee. I don't remember which one he met with. And they basically looked at the script and said, yeah, no, that's not the way it works. And the director was a writer director was smart enough to then meet with the American baseball players in Japan and say, tell me your stories. And then he rewrote the script. And mm -hmm. so a lot of the things that you see Tom Selleck go through actually happened on the field. And uh, mm -hmm. look up this article by Brad Lefton. Um, you can find it on Facebook, um, New York Times archives. It's really a great article. Mm -hmm. Thank you. John, Leonardo Daka, are you raising your hand? Is that what you're doing? I am because I can't figure out how to raise the, the artificial yellow hand. <laughs> um, so Rob, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, the first is, um, I saw a great uh, film about Japanese baseball called uh, Kano about uh, the kid's journey to play in Koshien. But I wondered if you could recommend any really any other great Japanese baseball films. And of course, I want to acknowledge a wonderful filmmaker with us today, Yuriko Romer, who's making a film about Japanese baseball. But what films can you recommend, Rob? I think the one that you mentioned is, is the best so far. Um, there really, I mean, there are films out there, but um, I can't really think of one that's accessible. Um, I think that's a, a beautiful film. I mean, it, it, I, I, I tell people, watch this film. I don't care if you don't care about baseball. It's a, it's a fantastic, film. it's a fantastic, and not only that, it's a period film and they, they really got the period right. And it's a wonderful story. What, what, what hot story or what great story about Japanese baseball should be made into a film, but hasn't, and would have a good audience. <laughs> um, oh, wow. I, I, I can't even begin. The, the 1934 tour. That would be a phenomenal movie. Well, I did sell the movie rights. <laughs> oh, there you go. It's going to, it's going to happen. I don't know if it will happen, but yeah, the movie rights have been bought. Um, there's a lot of, of stories. There's a story. I mean, of course, Japan has its own film industry, and uh, there's a lot of Japanese documentaries on baseball um, because of the, I mean, you know this, I, I barely know it, but, but the incompatibility between the videos from Asia to the United States. Broadcast standard, yes. It's very difficult to watch them. I mean, I'm sometimes sent them and I can't watch them on my computer. So... Um, I can't even recommend one in Japanese for you. But Yuriko undoubtedly is the expert to talk to. I'm sure she's seen everyone many times. So uh, maybe she can chime in here in a few seconds. I mean, I'm, that looks like Rob, are you yes, queuing me? Or yes, what? yes. <laughs> um, so John, we can talk more online, but there's actually not that many films in the u.s about u.s japan type of baseball thing there's probably a bunch of stuff in japan about you know movies that, about baseball like narrative films and um but i don't think there's a whole lot of documentaries you know nhk does stuff here and there but were you talking about the the koshian film the one that um what's her name just released last year because that's a really good one no, I haven't seen that one. I was talking about the dramatic film called Kano, K-A-N-O. Oh, I thought you were talking about um, Emma's film. What's, what's Emma's yeah, Emma, film? Emma's uh, I can't remember. That, that, that's a must-see film. Yeah, yeah because that I would say that too. It's Okay. I think it's called Koshien. I think you're right. All right, and, I'll look for it. 
it's definitely been released here too. It's subtitles and stuff. Emma Sasaki, uh, what's her last name? Uh, I can't remember. Anyways, if you, I think if you look up Koshin, but okay. so the one that you're, Rob, the one, wait a minute, John's talking about, and you said That's it's Kano, but it's probably Kano, right? Yeah, this is the Taiwanese team that, that won Koshien back in the 30s. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I actually have not seen that. Okay. Well, highly recommended. Okay. Well, I do have one that's coming out hopefully later this year that's about the um, internment told through baseball stories. And oh, wow. Kerry Nakagawa is a big star in it, but um, I actually just submitted it to my first festival yesterday, but it's still not finished. So hopefully by the end of the year, it'll be out in the world at festivals and stuff. So what's the title? Baseball Behind Barbed Wire. Here you go. Keep Kerry in touch with us. We'd love to uh, invite you to do a presentation on those, on that and Diamond Diplomacy as things move forward. I, okay. I see you on Facebook from time to time, so it'll be a good reminder. Well, the shorter one, the 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 baseball behind barbed wire is going to be out this year, so um, we can talk offline about it. Great. Great. Any other questions, comments for Rob? I have. Okay, go ahead, John. No, I already asked a question. You ask a question. I'll, no, no, this I'll, this is going to bump it in a different direction. So talk to Rob for a yeah. minute. So just a couple of things uh, I wanted to ask Rob about. Um, you know, the Japanese women's team, the national team, is a colossus. Uh, whenever there's been a, a sort of World Cup of women's baseball, they just wipe everybody out. Um, they had a women's professional baseball league for a while, but I think. They, um, it went belly up a few years ago. Do you know what the status of that is? I do not know anything about it other than they had a professional league then and they had one in the late 1940s as well, which I'd love to learn more about. Um, but there's almost nothing on, in English on that. So uh -huh. There's a book written. I believe, There is a book. Actually, I have a copy of it in Japanese written about it, but that doesn't help me too much. And just, just a quick follow-up about the men's professional league. Is it disingenuous to say that the level of play there is around triple a level or are they much more on equal footing with major league it's considered for a level um above the triple a's the problem they basically have is the rosters aren't deep enough so the championship team can probably come over and match nine players with most american teams and two starters but probably not five starters the bullpen in general is not strong enough. Their closer might be. Um, and, and that's the issue. And yeah, I have to remember that they allow only a handful of foreign players. And we have some American teams that are two thirds foreign players. So we get in the United States, we get the best players in the world. Japan gets the second best players in the world. Some of their players mm -hmm. are great, right? And, and as we know, you know they've proven. And um, but yeah, top to bottom, it's, it's not as strong. And one thing I just want to throw out there is we have to remember whether it's an American going to Japan or a Japanese coming to America, the ability to adapt to the new league, country, and social mm -hmm. setting is as important as their skill. So many of the Japanese players who come here are fabulous players. And for whatever reason, it didn't work out in the major leagues. It may be difficulty hitting a major league uh, sinker. It may be just the difficulty of getting food and not feeling comfortable in the city they're living. There's lots of different aspects for why players succeed in the leagues back and forth and for Americans too. So it's something that's often forgotten. I just want to toss out there. Thank you. Good point. It's also true of Latin American players coming to the United States. The cultural and linguistic barriers are are very real. Uh, Alex Stace, you have a question? Uh, how many games do you think Oakland A's would win in Japan? <laughs> <laughs> Not too many. <laughs> Y'all, um, come on now. <laughs> it's Saber Day. Day. We, we have to be nice. We're not disparaging anybody. <laughs> come um, on. No, you have said to that. You have, I did. <laughs> you have different styles of baseball too, right? Uh, that we, we just talked about. And um, 
it would be interesting to see how a a a um how should we say this not as productive team in the u.s would do in the japanese leagues um if you took the whole roster and moved it over if you had players who swung to the fences and were not very bonds um would they succeed in the japanese league my, my feeling is no they get eaten alive some of these guys i mean um gene carlos stanton i don't think he'd last half a season in japan they'd strike him out you know 300 times yeah he'd hit 50 home runs but who cares 300 strikeouts doesn't help your team um so it's a very different style you know you get the bat on the ball hit with power hitting the gaps um and so it, it would take yeah a, a, a poorly um developed american team i don't think would do that well just my opinion any other questions or comments for rob no yes uh Eureka, you have your hand up You need to uh, unmute yourself. Oh, there you go. That would be good. Um, so I just had, um, I was up in Seattle for the induction of Ichiro's into the Hall of Fame. And we were filming that and I did not get an interview, but I sat in the press conference. And um, well, so John Leonidakis's point of having a conversation, I felt like I was in this private conversation with Ichiro for a little bit. But um, I asked him when um, what he what he thought about his his own like cultural thing like that that he seems to to fit into the United States because he's been so long and he played here for so long and and he said oh no he said he's not at all suited towards American culture mm -hmm. and he said that I'm the way he put it was something like I'm more Japanese than most Japanese people. And then he told the story about how he had not even thought about playing in the United States until he was on one of the the all star matchup teams there. Mm -hmm. And then he ended up in 1996, he said, and, and he ended up seeing what the American MLB players, the level of play and his reaction was just sort of like, you know, he was just awed by it. And he said he realized in that moment that the maximum effort that he had been putting out in Japan could never produce the efforts that he had been producing in Japan if he were to play with these players. And then he eventually came here and look what he did. So, you know, I mean, it was, it was kind of interesting to just to get sort of this interesting inside look on someone who just really feels like he doesn't belong in the United States. He's not that type of personality. But his baseball sort of took on a whole new path because of seeing MLB players and, and feeling true. like he had to like open up a new chapter in his own playing. On the other side, I, I just um, was an event with Hideki Matsui last month and he lives in the United States. He's, he's never gone home. And so has uh, Matsuzaka stays in the United States. They feel more comfortable living here. And he actually is almost fluent in Amer in English. He, he keeps that hidden. So he doesn't have to speak too much, but he can speak eloquently in English. He's an incredibly intelligent person. And he just loves it in the United States. He loves the fact that he can go to the grocery store and people might say hi, but they won't bother him. And um, so, yeah, it depends on the personality of the player, how they adapt and, and what they do for the rest of their lives. What a wonderful conversation this has been. Do we have any uh, uh, last questions or comments for Rob before we wrap it up? Yeah, John, go ahead. Baseball cards are so important. I think they are the passport to the country of baseball. They taught me about geography. They taught me about people of color in the 1950s, where I grew up in San Francisco, there weren't a lot of people of color. That was really a, a strong introduction. So baseball cards, uh, as Rob said, are, are so important and really, uh, really are the glue that whole part of the game together. Back in the day, for us kids, for sure, uh, I'm not so sure today uh, if the kids are buying baseball cards the way they did back then. But they are awfully important. And I, I saw Rob's uh, uh, Japanese baseball card presentation at Sabre National in San Diego a few years ago, and it was excellent. So keep up the good work, Rob. 
Don't I love that with baseball? Was it baseball cards or the glue? Did you say what? What was that quote? They are the passport to the country of baseball. You also had another one about glue, and I think that's that should be a fill right there, <laughs> and that'll be a big seller if you do a not a history of baseball cards. That'd be boring, but but what do they mean, and how do they work into the culture and and bring America together? Sounds right up your alley. I think we got a project. Yep. And speaking of baseball cards, maybe we can invite Doug to. Uh, do a presentation on baseball cards uh, with us. How many, I don't know who, if you don't know, Doug McWilliams is a wonderful tops photographer and his, his photos are in the Baseball Hall of Fame. So a lot of the materials that you, the images you see from the hall are uh, thanks to, to Doug. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to bring up and it, I, we probably don't have time uh, now, maybe we can do a, a include this in a, another joint meeting is, uh, there's a wonderful program that Sabre offers called the Baseball Reminiscence Program. And we tried to get something started in the Bay Area, but uh, due to various things, we never got it going. And Baseball Reminiscence Program brings baseball, talking baseball to um, seniors and shut-ins. And uh, John is, is very much involved with that. John. I, I didn't ask you to do this, but could you say a few words about the program? I can, uh, you know, two or three minutes. I don't think that would do it justice, but I just want folks to have it on your radar in case anyone might be interested in getting involved in some way. Sure. The Sabre Baseball Memories Program is a signature a Sabre program. It's been in operation since 2015. The idea is to use baseball to build community with people with Alzheimer's, dementia, and chronic uh, health issues. And we got started with our uh, our South Texas chapter, and then I got one started in Los Angeles, and now I think we're operating in seven states, and all these programs are offered for free. Uh, we've got a promotional film, um, and if you go to saberbaseballmemories.org, you can learn more about the program, and you can see our little uh, three-minute promotional film. We also have a longer-form version of it. But the where the rubber meets the road is what you hear, what we hear from the care partners. The, um, the people from the families, uh, their friends who care for them, and from the participants themselves, um, you know, these are, these are terminal illnesses. They're going to die. Um, and um, how they kind of handle that, uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a devastating subculture. You don't want either of those things. Um, and the connections that we've been able to make using baseball um, allows people to open up and socialize and make connections because a lot of people when they have Alzheimer's or dementia, they kind of close up. And what we've experienced in the programs that we put together is that it allows them to feel comfortable. Uh, we create subjects or what you might call um, um, points that open them up to want to communicate and share their memories of baseball. And we'll have them wear their, their gear, you know, their, their Giants jersey or their A's hat and talk to us about their A's jersey, that first a, a baseball game that you went to, and they light up like Christmas trees, a lot of them. And typically we work with people in the early to moderate stage, but we also do a lot of work with the Veterans Affairs Program. I facilitate a program here in West Los Angeles. They're all in wheelchairs and they live in a, it's a live-in medical facility, but we play home run derby. I get the ball out there on a tee with a wiffle bat. And these guys are no longer crippled veterans in chairs. They're, they're home run hitters. And um, so it's been really, really beneficial. And we do it over Zoom and we do it uh, in person and it's gender neutral. We have a lot, of, uh, a lot of women who participate as well. And we're continuing to grow. And we've had Major League Baseball teams involved with us. The Cleveland Indians, our partner, uh, the Dodgers have worked with us. The Seattle Mariners are waiting to work with us as soon as we get a program going up there in the Seattle area. And uh, so we're, we're just getting started. But the program has impacted a lot of lives um, in a very positive way. And as uh, not just the participants, but for volunteers like us too. As my dad would say, it's good psychic income. Thank you. And if you're interested in bringing the program to your, uh, your Sabre chapter, uh, please reach out to me or visit our website, saberbaseballmemories.org. Well, what a great show we've had today. Thank you, Bob Fitz, and thank you, John Leonidakis. And thank, thank all you. of you for being here. It's been uh, wonderful. An international audience.
and across the country. Around Thanks. the world. Chile. Around Absolutely. the world. Yes. So we'll be, we'll be sending out information about our upcoming programs for the, uh, the joint chapter programs. Um, look forward to you joining us. If you have ideas about programs and if you'd like to get involved with either of the chapters, um, please contact me or Steve um, or Zach. Um, we welcome, we'd welcome you aboard. And if you're not yet a Sabre member, uh, consider joining us. We're always glad to have you. Wow. So much Thank great information much. and conversation. Wow. So glad I found you folks. Thank you. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you, Marlene, Zach, and Steve for putting it together. Yeah, thanks, Zach, for technical support. Well, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us today. Um, this will be on. I know um, just looking at some of the chat that uh, there were people hopping around multiple Sabre Day uh, events today, which is great. Um, but we will have this up on YouTube probably within the next day or two. If you do any of the keyword searches that, you know, Dusty Baker, Sacramento Sabre, or Lefty Odul Sabre, or Japanese Baseball, or John Leonidakis, or Robert, Fitt, whatever, um, I will make sure I put in as many keywords as possible in my YouTube uh, search to where it's easy for you. Um, and then also, if you go to that channel, you'll be able to see our prior meetings as well. So um, I really appreciate everybody uh, joining us today. And uh, if you're anywhere near the Sacramento area, hopefully we'll see you um, on March 18th at Sam's Hofbrau for our first in-person meeting in a while. Thanks, so thanks everybody. Uh, a everybody. great day. Right. Thanks, thanks, everybody. Can, I hear? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, 